church planter can walk 20 miles in a day. Give him a bicycle and he can go three times as far and be three times as effective. Thank you so very much for joining me once again as we continue our chronological study through the entire New Testament. And you, if you're a regular watcher, you know we're in Acts chapter 8 now, uh, looking at the first uh, widespread persecution of the church that followed the martyrdom of Stephen. And we uh, posited the idea that perhaps God permitted that martyrdom and this persecution in order to uh, gain the effect uh, that was gained, that the church was scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Goodness, the very places that the Lord had told the apostles that uh, he would send them. But Against that theory is the fact that it says in the scripture that everyone was scattered except the apostles. And so I'm still scratching my head over that one. I'm hoping that we have some very wise and insightful viewer who's going to send me an email and help me to understand what was going on there. So we start off today in Acts chapter 8, verse number 3. But Saul began ravaging the church entering house after house and dragging off men and women, he would put them into prison. And so this was terrifying. I mean, you just think about it. I mean, someone banging on your door with a bunch of Roman guards who's authorized to, to drag you out of your own house and just based upon the fact that uh, there's some evidence that you've uh, converted to Christianity and before your weeping and screaming children just drag you out and throw you into prison. And what happened after that? You know, I don't exactly know. Did they get a fair trial and so forth? Did they have any rights? It doesn't say. Um, I, I mentioned to you last time that it is significant that, you know, Saul and his helpers, you know, didn't uh, go to any church buildings to drag out Christians because there were no buildings to drag Christians out of. He had to go from house to house. That's where the church was meeting, and that's not the first time that it's mentioned here in Acts chapter 8. And I told you last time that I might this time, probably this time, would tell you a little bit of the history of how uh, the church gravitated to where it is today, to where so many don't even think of meeting in houses. Uh, and if they do, it's just, you know, relegated to a Bible study or a small group. But church really happens in a church building. Well, I want to submit to you that very few people had such thoughts. Well, no one had such thoughts back in, in, in 34 AD uh, in the early church, and it was decades and decades and decades and decades and decades before anyone had a thought of having a special building where Christians could meet. And now, uh, archaeological excavations show that, yeah, there were some public uh, buildings that were used uh, exclusively for Christian worship uh, in the first three centuries here and there, but it really didn't make a major shift until the beginning of the fourth century. Uh, what happened then? Well, th in the Roman Empire, which was the only big empire in the world at the time, ruling, you know, the, the most of the civilized or uncivilized, civilized and uncivilized world at that time, um, you know, the Christians were second-class citizens and, and persecuted to greater and lesser degrees uh, by local authorities as well as by the imperial authorities of the, you know, the Roman emperors. Perhaps the guy who is the worst of all well-known today in history uh, as Emperor Diocletian uh, in the early 4th century. I mean, he's the guy that's throwing the Christians to the lions and burning them at the stake and starving them and, and, and impaling them and, and, and just all kinds of uh, horrible persecutions, confiscating their property and so forth. And so it was a terrible, terrible time to, to be a, a Christian in the Roman Empire. But along comes another emperor by the name of Constantine. You probably heard about him. Uh, his mother exposed him to Christianity early on. Her name was Helena. Uh, she toured the Holy Land and one of those gals that brought back various artifacts uh, of the true cross and other you know, alleged uh, things that you find in scripture. Uh, but Constantine didn't convert apparently to Christianity till he was in his early 40s. 
And he was never baptized, actually, uh, until right before his death. So historians debate whether he really, really converted. His conversion story is told as follows, that he was uh, entering into the battlefield and he looked up at the sun and saw some kind of a light with a cross and heard a voice that said something to the fact of, this, use this sign and you'll win. And so he, he inscribed crosses on the front of all the uh, shields of his soldier, soldiers, and from then on, they won their victories. And so uh, it was Constantine who ultimately legalized Christianity in, throughout the entire Roman Empire in, I think it was 313 AD, through the Edict of Milan. And from that point in time, everything changed. Uh, Christians uh, begin to rise a little bit to the surface. Uh, they're no longer a persecuted second-class citizenry. And in fact, uh, Constantine, as time went on, showered them with more and more uh, imperial favor and built huge basilicas and churches. And he, he becomes, you know, the, the, the patron, the great benefactor and patron of the church. And so initially, everybody's happy about this, all the Christians and professing Christians. Wow, we finally got peace. We're not persecuted. And now we've got a chance. In fact, we're being favored by the government. And ultimately, Constantine, you know, basically makes Christianity the, 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 uh, uh, you know, the official religion uh, of the Roman Empire, just giving favor to Christians more so than anybody else, and uh, never succeeded. But remember, this is a huge move. I mean, before that, it was just all those Roman gods that you read about uh, related to the Greek gods, the, the Zeuses and uh, Apollos and all those guys, and now this huge shift. But again, Constantine, uh, you know, <laughs> was he called by God? Did, did he you know, really believe the scripture and so forth? I, I don't know, there's major doubts about that. But that's the time of the great shift in the church. And, and everybody becomes a Christian because it's the popular thing to do. They've got priests who used to be a priest of Zeus just yesterday, now he's the priest of uh, you know, the God of the Christians today. And all these rites are brought into the church and the, you know, the purity is, is corrupt. Okay, all right, so. That's enough of that. We'll get into just a little bit more in the next segment. Okay, looking forward to that. And so I will see you next time. Heavenward 7 is made possible by the financial support of viewers like you. Thank you.